Another uh, edition of Live from the Loft. Something calls me to the sea Like the stars when you're out to sea And you feel the swell Like the times that you're good to me My silver bell What's up guys, it's Dave with another tip video. Now this isn't gonna be your standard video tip from me. Instead, today I'm gonna talk to you about something I'm even less qualified to teach, which is guitar. 
So uh, some of you know, about a million years ago, I was in a band. And when I was in that band, I was just the lead singer. I couldn't play any instruments at all. And I always really wanted to be able to play the guitar. I wanted to be able to sit around with friends, around a campfire, and, and sing songs or write my own songs um, without having to like hum what I thought the guitar part should sound like. So I, I tried to learn for a really long time, and I could never get it. It was the, you know, the complexity of, of your fingers uh, moving in all the different shapes for the chords. I, I just couldn't figure it out. Uh, so I tried that for, you know, off and on for about 10 or 15 years. I'd given up on the idea for several years. And about 10 years ago, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to learn to play one song. So I googled what's an easy song to play on the guitar. The first thing that came up was Glycerine by Bush. Uh, it uses power chords. And so I thought, all right, I like this song. It's a good song. I can sing it. So let's learn it. And what I found when I learned it was that while playing guitar is really difficult and being good at guitar is insanely difficult, playing power chords really isn't. And the one element that I struggled with, that changing my finger placement, goes away when you're playing power chords. So all the videos that I'm going to do in this series are going to be teaching you how to play songs utilizing only power chords, because it's the only way I know how to play. I don't know any of the actual chords, uh, but I don't need to to be able to play songs. I play out sometimes uh, and play just like this, and no one seems to mind. Um, I play for my family and my friends all the time. I really enjoy it. So anyway, if you've been someone who's wanted to learn how to play the guitar and you just couldn't figure it out and it, you found it frustrating, um, this might be the series for you because we're not here to impress anybody. We're just here to be able to learn how to play this music, uh, play the songs that we love, write our own songs. Um, and you know, if you don't have a ton of time to dedicate, this is the way to go. I'm also not saying if you learn how to play like this, you'll become a great guitarist. Um, you know, I, that'd probably be pretty difficult. There are some limiting aspects to it. Uh, you know, you can't play like the minor chords really or sustained chords or anything like that, the variations, but it gets the job done and it's fun. And it, it kind of, like I said, it demystifies guitar. It makes it accessible. So without further ado, we're just going to get into it. So a power chord is just a three note chord. Uh, and it's always played on only three strings and the cool thing about them is that the structure of the chord is always the exact same. So this hand, the hand that's actually playing the chord, uh, it will move around on the neck of the guitar and it'll move from the top string, the E string, to the A string sometimes. Uh, but it'll never, your, your finger placement never actually has to move. So like the shape of your hand will stay the same, which makes it super, super easy. So, um, so here's a basic power chord. If, uh, so this is the E string. So if you start on the third fret, this is how to play a G. If you start on the third fret on the E string, then every single power chord is gonna be just like this. It's the two strings below, two frets up. That's it, that's the placement of your hand right there. Hopefully you can see that well. So when you play power chords, that's a G, you can slide anywhere on the neck it will make a chord. Now, if you're playing on the E string, you're playing the top three strings. Once you switch to the A string, you're gonna wanna use your thumb to mute the top string so you don't accidentally hit that. And the big thing is, if you play these, the bottom two strings, I don't know what those are because I don't use them. If you play those, uh, then it will sound like crap. All right, so let's just get into the first tutorial. I learned glycerine first, so I figure I'll teach you that one. It's really easy, it's just four chords. It's almost the same strumming pattern the entire time. So uh, it starts with an F, which is first string, first fret. And like I said, it's a power chord, so you know your other fingers are gonna go the two strings right below it, two frets up. So it starts with an F. Then it goes to a C, which is the second string, the A string, third fret, your other two fingers, two strings below, two frets up. Then it's gonna go up to a D, which is just the fifth fret, same for the other two fingers. Then it's gonna go down to a B. So you have F, C, D, and B. That's it. So for the verses, it must be a skin. I'm sinking in, it must be for real, cause now I can feel, and I didn't mind. So that's it. 
So the only time it changes at all is at the end of the choruses. Don't let your days go by glycerine. So that's it. So uh, also, I don't, I'm not going to teach you the bridges of hardly any songs. I hardly ever play them. Uh, most of the time because I don't know how to, but also because I don't usually like them that much. So if there's a really cool bridge, I'll play it. Um, there's a few songs that I play them in, but for the most part, I don't play them. Um, and, you know, if there's a part of a song that people that are singing along with you aren't going to know, it's usually going to be the bridge. So just skip it anyway. If it was, if it was good, it'd be a verse, right? Uh, so anyway, um, that's it for Glycerine. Be on the lookout. There's going to be a lot more of these videos coming. This week we have a special guest, Robert Dorian. Everyone, to my right, he's a, a great friend. And uh, I believe I met you through J.J. Favini. That's right. And was it the Acme Bar and Grill or was it East State? I think it, it was, was a bar. It was, was a bar. And I think they were hosting one of the uh, many uh, open mic nights that we have here in Fort Wayne. And, okay. And... Uh, I met you, uh, JJ had mentioned that you had this place and you needed a sound guy and he goes, how about Robert? I had just got back from some tour and... Uh, I don't think we ever looked back. I think that when we met, that it was instantaneous. You came to the studio, I went to your studio, you brought me to Troy's studio. It was like I saw the studio, studio, studio. Right, yeah. I came up here <laughs> yeah. and I saw this place and I... I've heard stories and oh, yeah. of, of the many Fort Wayne events that have happened up here. There's been a little bit of music. And I, yeah. I think I came uh, during a time when, yeah, the Phoenix downstairs was hopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's right. Lots of shows. And then you had this place upstairs, and I took a broom to it. And then Troy took a, a can of paint and a brush. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's and right. Then you guys both he, came Then he in took a whole lot of gear you guys from his both? studio. Yeah, mm -hmm. put some blood, sweat in this place. We got some mm -hmm. keyboards. We have some recording equipment. Well, yeah. Af actually, after Robert showed up, it really started in Troy. It really started to become a studio. Robert then, brought a, but the Rhodes with him and, uh, and, and a C3, well, which yeah. is, is basically <laughs> a B3, yeah. you know, Hammond. It's uh, uh, fantastic. And, yeah, thanks, guys, for helping. Help me get up. And then uh, we ended up, it up the stairs. <laughs> that's how I met Troy, actually, through you. That's right. And mm -hmm. we went over to his studio and started recording my album and right away. So, yeah, yeah, how many other projects have we been on? I mean, there's been the most recently the Chili one, the, the song we did mm -hmm. for him, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, then um, Dwayne Eby. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. We did that. We did that. Yeah, that was over that. at your studio, With I Will. believe. We no, that was at John Gillespie's studio. Man, yes. there's so much good stuff happening in here. In yeah. Time, right? Yeah. It's funny because right when I met you, we went to studios as well. Like I had the same experience. I met you into your studio. you introduced me to Matt over here. And then shortly after that, we went to Bob Phillips' studio. Bob Phillips, 2220 sound design. Yeah. He has yeah. a neat place. Yeah. Great and it, vibe. It'd be a cool thing someday to do some highlights of studios and whatnot. Cause yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I'm so happy to have met you. Yeah. And this place has been magic, um, you know, to have all yes. the old, um, I don't mean old, I'm old, but the, the established Fort Wayne bands come back in force, you know, hearing everybody, you know, going, oh, the Phoenix Loft is happening again. And, and now with the recording that's taking place here. It's just Yeah, awesome. they all seem to pass through here at one time or another. So, uh, how did you get started in music? Uh, well... I tell people, like, first you do everything wrong, and you end up in music. <laughs> I, I, I was, um, let's see, how, how do you get started in music? I, I was more engineering, thinking I would follow in my dad's footsteps. He was an engineer for Gillette, um, okay. made razor blades. And uh, the, the path was, um, I was never really that good. I mean, there have been great players, you know, and you listen to them, and you're, wow, that's music it's magic and these people are making you know yeah making magic um but uh i was intrigued by technology you know uh synthesizers you turn on the radio in the early 80s and you heard the new drum sounds you heard the new synth sounds and you're like my ears perked up what's doing that i want to know more that's so cool who was uh who was the first synth band that you you noticed i, I think gary newman you know cars uh -huh. yeah here in my car um, that 
uh, I remember, you know, that opening Polly Moog, blah, 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 mm -hmm. sound. that was, you know, oh, race yeah. home because I knew when it was going to be on the radio <laughs> and uh, turn it up. Um, so, and then, you know, being from Boston, uh, we had a lot of great bands, a lot of new wave, like the Cars, huge influence. Greg Hawks playing those iconic mm. melodic key lines. Um, I mean, just great, great stuff. Um, Devo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thomas Dolby, Howard Jones. Yes. Yeah. Um, they were taking uh, the synth to the, the forefront, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, traditionally keyboard guys were trapped like a drummer behind our equipment and the mm -hmm. guitar player and the lead vocalist are having all the fun out front. Um, I don't even want to bring up the key tar, so we won't <laughs> go there. <laughs> but, you know, to sonically have a lead instrument be a, a synthesizer like Gary Newman brought to the forefront, that was it. That was my calling. Nice. You, uh, you graduated from Berkeley? I okay. did. I was uh, studying at Northeastern University, again, following in my dad's foot, uh, footsteps, mechanical engineering. And, uh, you know, three semesters of that, but my keyboards were filling the dorm room. And I said, yeah, no, Berkeley offered a um, accredited degree program in music synthesis, of all things. So oh, neat. I go, that's it. I transferred. And that, I was, that was cutting edge at the time. That right? was the, the people <coughs> I went to school with. I studied with uh, Dave Mash was the head of the program. He's the guy that said, this electronic music is going to turn into something. Let's make this a full degree program. And Mike Brigida, who was one of the first to you know, um, explore sampling with the Kurzweil, um, Chris Noyes, I could go on, these uh, Richard Boulanger, genius synth guys at the leading edge, um, and then working with uh, people that went on to play with Mariah Carey, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I could, I could name, the, the, yeah. name, the name yeah, dropping, right? Are, <laughs> I, I can't help but nose your hat, so uh, you're a big motorcycle fan. I yeah. know you have an RC51. I have a I Honda RC51. Yes. And then you also have a new addition to the family. I have a, a new old edition, an XR 400. Always wanted a dirt bike. I had a dirt bike. It got stolen. Now I got a. That's new like a dirt bike enduro, right? That's it's just, you know, it's it's you know. um, I don't know. I'm, I'm. I mean, it's street legal. What do they say? You know, uh, I'm 18, celebrating my 30 something anniversary or something. <laughs> 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 or you know, I forget about it. Yeah. Um, I, I love the bikes. Um, they. There, my piano teacher told me something a long time ago, Mike Mara. He says, you can be one of these cats that go to the practice room and shed eight hours a day, mm -hmm. um, but then uh, you won't have anything to play about. Hmm. So go out and live a life, and when you come back to the piano, oh, yeah. you have something to play about. You can pour it into your Yeah, into it's your not work. just a technician thing. It's life. It's you're, pour, you're pouring your music back, or your life back through your music. So from, from Boston, Berkeley... To Fort Wayne, Indiana, and then to all over the world. I mean, since I've known you, I've known you to be, hey, Matt, I'm in town. Hey, Matt, I'm leaving. I'm off. I got to do this thing with Tool. <laughs> I got to go do this thing with Aerosmith. On and on. Right. Meatloaf, right. you know. Uh, so get me from Berkeley out here to, uh, to, to now. Okay. So, um, Graduated Berkeley, wanted to be in music. I thought maybe recording studio. The synthesizers were um, happening. It was making a lot of music in the 80s, and they were still being used for newer creative ways. Um, digital audio recording was in becoming mm -hmm. more and more accessible and in vogue. Yep. It was on the cutting edge of that with the old sound tools before Pro Tools. Yeah. It was just two yeah. tracks of recording. Anyhow, it's a fast-moving train, that technology. I just knew I was going to be a part of it. So I kept my foot in the door by working in music stores like EU Wurlitzer's and mm -hmm. Daddy's Junkie Music in Boston, big oh, neat. Yeah. hitters, you know. Um, and, and then I, uh, I made a vow never to work music retail again. More on that <laughs> later. But I, I decided to get more of an uh, office job, and um, I worked at Berkeley College of Music in their business office making copies. And it was during that time Saturday Night Live had a skit about the guy that was making copies. Making copies, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robert, so, making copies. That's right. It's uh, Troy Rama. Graduated from Berkeley. Troy Rama, making five copies. Yeah. Right. Um, so th from there, I, uh, uh, one day a guy walked into my office, um, and he was looking for 
uh, a jingle writer that knew all about the digital recording and music synthesis. And I said, look no further. Got a job writing jingles with him in huh. Pennsylvania. It's about the time um, I was uh, recently married to my wife, Susan, and she's a piano teacher, a wonderful piano teacher. Yeah, um, an accomplished pianist. Uh, uh, yes. New England Conservatory, master's degree in piano performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, and yeah. It is, it's wonderful. Um, now, she was uh, at home while I tried jingle writing in Pennsylvania. And at home, she was up in the Boston area. And when I moved back, I got that job at Berkeley, uh, <coughs> another job at Berkeley, actually, uh, 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 managing the learning center, helping the kids uh, with the computers and the synths. Uh huh. Yeah. After the teachers went home, I was there in the evening. Um, at the same time in the day, I was uh, writing manuals for Kurzweil. Um, nice. The, the, the K2000 version 2 um, manual, I helped with that. Um, at the, around that time, I had a good friend, Dan Fisher. Maybe you know the name. He's um, uh, plays keys in Pink Droid here yeah, in town. I, know Dan. Uh, I think Dan's he, been. Has Dan been over? Has Dan Dan's been by here? Yeah, Dan's been by. Yeah, sure. His name popped up on our episode with, with Diamond Lil. Be funny. A lot of the names that yeah. are brought up are brought up by different people. And, so know. I sent Dan out to Fort Wayne before even thinking about moving here. He took a job. <laughs> oh, <with yeah>. <laughs> 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 he got a job at Sweetwater. We, uh -huh. uh, he's been. Um, we both graduated uh, Berkeley in '89. Uh, from s music synthesis, he got another degree in music production as well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we were both mu one of the first music synth uh, graduates, so it's a neat alumni of people there. Um, so Dan uh, was out here and he said, hey, Sweetwater is looking for people to sell gear on the phone. And I said, well, I made a vow never to work retail again, but <laughs> let's give it a shot. And they uh, hired me more or less on the spot saying, you know, you've done all this. Dan likes you. We're cool with Dan. We're cool with you. Yeah. And I uh, got a job, worked there for 10 years, watched that company grow. Um, it was it grew a little bit. I mean, it's still it, just a small retail It was just 40 <laughs> people when I started. What is yeah. it now, 45, Maybe 400 million or something. I, <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> closer, yeah. right? It's a, it, it, <laughs> Somewhere uh, in there. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, it was about 10 years I had um, uh, had enough time uh, selling gear. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to, you know, see what else there was to do in music. and took some time and um, it was a, it's almost like magic I can tell the story but uh, I got a call from um, some friends that knew I was looking for work and N Nine Inch Nails was coming to town mm -hmm. and they needed a keyboard tech and uh, it was and you said I wrote the manual <laughs> <laughs> something like that I mean I, I put that out there and the universe answered I said you know I want to be a keyboard tech and uh -huh. the phone rang it so you get your helped. start with Nine Inch Nails. I did. I did. Most people yeah. get a, their start driving around in a, uh, in a van. In the van, back of the van. Know, right, yeah. loading their own gear. And mm -hmm. I get to ride in a million dollar Prevost bust with the really? um, yeah. um, the best of the best. The Prevost. Everybody that's on tour talks about Prevost buses. It, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, just the thing I hear about. <laughs> it, it's a neat life. It's not yeah. for everybody. I've seen, um, I've had some hard days. I've seen some people not cut it just from the... The lifestyle yeah. of being in close quarters and driving from city from city to city, not being grounded, really. So, what what's it like making that decision to? You have a steady job. It's in retail. You've had big dreams of you know of, of doing synthesis work your entire life. The opportunity comes along, and but you still have to kind of debate it in your head. I, I've had somewhat of a, a similar experience of like, do I quit? my guaranteed job to follow my dream you made that decision like what what was the thought process it wasn't easy um, in fact the opportunity to go on the road had um, come up prior to me actually making the leap um, uh, I when I worked at Kurzweil there was a product specialist there Jordan Rudis maybe you know him from Dream Theater yeah I've heard the name He's, uh, <laughs> you may have prior the name too <laughs> perhaps one of the premier <laughs> keyboardists of our time um, you know and there's, there's a few of them uh, and he's one of them and he was uh, one of my customers at Sweetwater and we would mm -hmm. talk we knew each other at Kurzweil casually but uh, yeah he says hey you know I need a tech why don't you come out on the road and I said you Jordan you know I've got two kids and a home and some bills. I can't leave this job, you know, even though it was commission sales and I, you know, had to work to earn whatever I was going to earn that mm -hmm. week. I was still there and I knew it was my, my 
source of income, and I couldn't leave that. And then um, a couple other calls. Uh, uh, Nine Inch Nails was part of my sales history as well. Though, uh, uh, even though I never spoke to Trent Reznor himself when I was um, his sales rep for Nothing Studios down in New Orleans, mm -hmm. I would talk to his people. And um, I remember it was like a big deal had come through. It was around Valentine's Day, so I asked the office uh, receptionist what her favorite candy was, and she goes, oh, chocolate-covered cherries, uh, chocolate-covered cherries. And uh, I knew DeBrands was here in town, mm -hmm. local chocolatier. And I sent her some of that, and thanks for the business type of thing, you know, like a good sales guy. Well, she calls back. She, she loves them. Hey, by the way, Trent's looking for a synthesis to come down here and work on some video games. Can you, you know, do you know anybody? Uh-huh. And I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, do I? <laughs> do I, do I, do I? What does this guy do? I can't. I have a job here. I'm going to give her a couple names that I know. Mm -hmm. John Luke Cohen, uh, one of my uh, students back at Berkeley when, when we worked at the uh, synth lab or the learning sem center together, he was a work-study student, gave him Trent's name. He went down there, did great work with Trent. They needed another person. Um, I still told them, no, I can't. <laughs> I call up another good friend of mine, Matt, Matthew Temple. Um, he worked with Trent. He's been working with Mel Gibson lately now huh. because of calls like that that yeah. I pass up. And yeah. Yeah. No, so <laughs> yeah, you open the door for them. Right, <laughs> well, I'm at Sweetwater for another two or so years before I decided that was it. And well, it was if Warren Haynes ever calls you, let him know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can but help. Uh, yeah, can long help. story short, I, d I got a call. A couple months went by, and I got a call when I was down on my luck. And I think I was just open to whatever would come my way, and I put it out there that mm -hmm. I wanted to be a keyboard tech. And I got the job, and I went out there, and they were, they were kind of laughing at first. The very first show uh, was here in Fort Wayne at the Coliseum, and uh, it was fantastic. I hear good things about that show, but I was in this oh my god mode, you know, running yeah. around trying to figure things out. And the guys on the crew were laughing, going, "Who's the new guy? Where's he from? Oh, right here in Fort Wayne. Great, we won't need to fly him home tonight." <laughs> <laughs> You know, and Save you us a couple hundred bucks. You can't be new forever, Dorian. That's mm -hmm. it. I went from Nine Inch Nails to Evanescence, Joss Stone, um, Dream Theater. I finally got to work with Jordan for four years. That was fantastic. Nice. I, yeah. You know, just watching him, you, you feel like you've become a better musician. That's great. And that's the other thing, the joy of what I do, as I get to be right there on the side of the stage watching some of the best musicians of our time. Yeah, you know Trent Reznor again with <coughs> How to Destroy Angels, Blink One and D Two, um, Angels and Airwaves with um, Tom DeLonge. Um, I was out on the Glee live tour, um, you know, doing playback. Yeah, I bet that was pretty neat. Oh yeah, we we, we had we, yeah that, that world class really musicians and yeah just that, that have been a ball of fun. You know the, the way that the production is, the how large of a production that is. Uh -huh. Uh, live concert movie in 3D being filmed. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's another thing that's crazy. I'm going to get old someday, older, and look back and see all these credits. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, you know. Oh, yeah, yep, and, and, and see a lot of people you worked with. How many times do you have to do a show before you can, like, enjoy it? Like, you know, you're sitting there watching some of the, the greatest musicians of our time. When does the routine of it, you know, allow you to enjoy that, the moment? It's a great question because um, does it ever? <laughs> I'm I'm anxious by nature. I'm nervous right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, no. I, if you let your guard down, that's when something um, happens mm -hmm. inevitably. Um, although I think the answer is that's up to the musician to transcend the moment and to really capture you. I mean, I get to work with Billy Idol and Steve Stevens, and to listen to Steve Stevens play his guitar every night. And there's some moments that you just, yeah. And you start looking at the other crew members. You hearing this? It's it's unreal, and oh. it's just lightning in a bottle. You know, grabbing yeah. the wire. It's awesome. Fantastic. <clears throat> so yeah, I think it does happen. I don't suggest <laughs> falling victim to it. Yeah, don't get used <laughs> to it. <laughs> yeah, no, but know that's why you're there, and uh, and you know something's happened. Wait till the song's over. 
and you hear that roar of the crowd. I mean, I don't yeah. care who you are. I'm not out there on stage. Yeah. If, if you see me on stage, something went wrong. <laughs> yeah. I don't deserve any applause. But <laughs> the applause that that act gets is, is felt by everybody on stage. You know, it's a wave of humanity. It's energy. It's, mm -hmm. it's awesome. And I can get why these guys want to get out there every night. Listening. 